Welcome back to part two of our series on security and encryption. We've talked about what makes passwords vulnerable, how a hacker can go about guessing a user's password, and how you can make secure passwords that are resistant to cracking. In this third video, we'll talk about issues involving the storage of passwords on the web server. If the server hasn't done a very good job of securing passwords, it may not matter how good the password is. There may be another way of getting it. We began part two by looking at a hack of password on Adobe site, which has been fixed, but any passwords are still vulnerable unless they've been changed. The absolute worst is storing and transmitting the passwords in plain text, which is what healthcare.gov was doing for at least the first few months after going public. Rockyou.com was hacked in 2009, and hackers got 13 million plain text passwords straight from their database. Some of them even email your password in plain text whenever you change or create it. What? What are they thinking? Jason Pierce has compiled a table of the password policies of banking websites, and the results are pretty scary, especially considering how important the security of banking websites is. Most disturbing is Charles Schwab, which, as of this video's recording, limits passwords to eight characters, and they can only be lowercase letters and numbers. Even in an absolute best case scenario, with a perfectly random password, and Eve having to exhaust the entire search space, Eve can get Alice's Charles Schwab password in less than three months. Do they want people to hack them? Most of the others are better, but only marginally. Citigroup, Simple, and First Tennessee seem to be the best in this regard. But much of the table remains to be filled out. Check your own bank's password policy to make sure they allow secure passwords, and do the same with other websites where you store sensitive information. Some don't allow a password to begin with a number. AT&T only allows the underscore and hyphen as symbols, and prevents people from using curse words in their passwords. Why? Understand, there is no reason to limit passwords in this fashion. There is no reason to restrict password length so much. Understand that supposedly the password is being hashed to begin with, and all hashes will be the same length. So it's not like they have to worry about you using up extra space with a 50 character password. There is also no reason to restrict which characters you can type in. Most disturbing is the password restrictions on healthcare.gov. Not only do we have the ridiculous 20 character limit, look at the characters you aren't allowed to type. Why not? Why restrict those characters? Anyone with any experience in database security will tell you why. Those characters are used for a type of database attack called an SQL injection. But first off, there are other, better ways of preventing injection attacks. Second, and more disturbingly, why are they worried about an SQL injection in a password field? Any programmer with an ounce of sense will store a salted hash of these passwords, which means that these characters will get obliterated. It's only the characters in the hash that should be sent to the database. So why would they worry about SQL injections unless they're storing the passwords in plain text? None of this is a good sign. Obviously, Storing the password in plain text is bad. But so is hashing the password without salting it. This leaves you vulnerable to a rainbow table attack. Let's say you have a password that rhymes with assword. The password gets hashed with SHA-256 and stored in the database, but it isn't salted. Everyone who uses that same password on the website will have the same hash, and so will people who use the same password on a completely different website that hashes passwords with the same hashing algorithm without salting. This allows the hacker to create a rainbow table. Eve has a dictionary of thousands of common passwords, and she also stores hashes of these passwords with various popular hashing algorithms. If she grabs a password database and sees there is no salt, and she works out which hashing algorithm has been used, all she has to do is search her table for matches. She doesn't even have to run the hashing algorithm herself. It's already been done, and she's just matching the hashes in the user databases to the ones in her table of popular passwords. She gets them almost instantly. Additionally, similar to what we saw with the Adobe example, if Eve cracks a password for one user that is also being used by other users, she notices that the hashes are the same, and therefore the passwords are the same too. Of course, if your password isn't in the dictionary, Eve can't use this method, and she has to resort to one of the other techniques we've discussed. 
but she'd be able to get a lot of passwords, maybe even a majority of them, with a rainbow table that's already been set up based on how users tend to generate passwords. So what Bob should do on his web server is give each user a unique salt, which is simply a random number or sequence of characters. The bigger the salt, in other words, the greater number of possible salts there are, the better protection from rainbow attacks he'll have. For best results, he should use a cryptographically secure pring to generate a salt that is as long as the resulting hash will be. For example, SHA-256 generates a 32-byte hash, so he should have his pring generate 32 random bytes for the salt. He then appends the salt to the password and hashes that. The salt should be unique to each password, not merely each user. This means that Every time Alice changes her password, Bob's server should randomly generate a new salt as well. The purpose of a salt is to protect against rainbow attacks. It doesn't protect against any of the other attacks we've talked about, but it does force Eve to go through the process. She has to get the salt, and then try hashing password after password until she gets the correct one. The more you make her go through to try each password, the fewer passwords she can try per second, and the longer it takes her to go through the search space. Even after going through this, the password on Bob's server can still be vulnerable if he chooses a weak hashing algorithm. For the longest time, MD5 was used to securely store passwords, but as computers became more powerful, better hashing algorithms were needed. Nowadays, MD5 is considered too weak for secure use because it doesn't take as long as it did to run through a certain number of possible passwords. Hashing algorithms can be weak in other ways. A particular algorithm might be vulnerable to a pre-image attack. Remember that we aren't comparing plain text passwords, only the results of that hash. So Eve doesn't actually need to find the actual password Alice typed in. She just has to find something that results in the same hash. SHA-256 results in a 256-bit hash, or 32 bytes. So Eve can find something that will work like the password just by trying every single combination of 32 bytes. Now, that's actually something like 115,000 trillion, 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 trillion combinations, so it's going to take her a while, far longer than the entire age of the universe. It's computationally unfeasible, unless there's a flaw in the algorithm. A flaw would mean that some hashes are more likely than others, which means that if the database has a sufficient number of users, the chances increase of one of these more common hashes. If Eve has a list of these common hashes and values that result in them, she can look through the database for a matching hash and use that value for the password, even if it's not the user's original password. So far, all the pre-image attacks discovered have been purely theoretical. None of them have been significant enough for Eve to exploit practically. But there is a variation on this which is more practical. It's called a collision. The difference between a collision attack and a pre-image attack is that any match can be used, not just a specific one. To illustrate what I mean, let's look at birthdays instead of passwords. We'll assume that all birthdays are equally likely and that nobody is born on leap day. Eve has one chance in 365 of having the same birthday as Alice. She also has a 1 in 365 chance of having the same birthday as Bob, so her chances of matching either birthday, the pre-image attack in our analogy, increases to 2 in 365. However, with a collision attack, we also look at whether Alice and Bob have the same birthday. Here, it doesn't have to be Eve's birthday specifically which matches. Any match will do. So now we have three possible matches instead of just two. Now let's bring Carol in. Now how many chances do we have of a match? You may recognize this as a statistical problem known as the handshake problem. If everyone shakes hands with each other person once and only once, how many handshakes are there all total? Since there are four people, each of them shakes hands with three others. So you might think that the number of handshakes is 12, but remember, a handshake involves two people. We're double counting, so we need to divide that result by two. So with four people, there are six total handshakes. In our birthday scenario, each handshake is a chance of a birthday match, so we now have six chances of there being a match somewhere. Using this formula, we can easily see how many possible matches there are with any number of people. If there are 10 people in the room, the number of chances are 10 times 9 divided by 2, or 45. 
Surprisingly, you only need 23 people in the room to have a good chance of any two of them having the same birthday. This is known in statistics as the birthday problem, or birthday paradox. Since a collision attack is based on this same mathematics, a collision attack on a hashing algorithm is also known as a birthday attack. So as you can see, a birthday attack is much easier to do than a pre-image attack. And unlike the pre-image attack, the collision attack has been shown to be practical in the real world. In 2008, a collision attack against the MD5 algorithm was used to forge an X509 signing certificate, meaning the hacker can impersonate a certificate authority on the web. We'll talk more about CAs later in part two. He would have had to use a pre-image attack to impersonate one particular CA, but with the collision attack, a match to any CA would work. MD5's weaknesses were well known by 2004, but they were still in common use by 2008. This experience has led to better security. The SHA-1 algorithm was shown to be vulnerable, but not very. It's extremely improbable that someone will be able to forge SHA-1 X509 certificates anytime soon, but several CAs have announced that they will have SHA-1 based certificates phased out by the end of 2015. We'll talk more about these issues later in part two. So by now, you should have a good idea of how to make strong passwords that are hard to crack, and the steps web servers should take to secure these passwords. In the next video, we'll talk about securing emails so that they can't be read by anyone but the recipient.